Very good. Very good. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming this early uh, at uh, this event. Um, so, uh, my name is Cyril. Uh, I am the founder, uh, managing director at Hacks. Um, and uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, have you today here. Um, this is actually the, the third hardware trend we are going to release. We started back in, uh, in 2015. Um, and uh, this year we thought it would be a, a little bit more uh, uh, interesting and fun if you could uh, see us uh, present uh, some of these documents. So this will be an excerpt of the Hardware Trends 2017 that we'll be releasing uh, next week and uh, we'll be uh, sending to you. Uh, for this occasion we flew the entire uh, management team of, of Hacks. Um, here we have uh, Ben, Duncan and, and Kate uh, who will uh, also uh, go over a few uh, of the slides uh, for about an hour. Uh, and then uh, we will all, you know, uh, have a little chat afterwards. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know about uh, Hacks uh, or uh, SOSV, um, I'll just uh, mention a, a few things. Uh, we are a venture firm um, that has about a $150 million uh, fund uh, that was uh, our third fund here. Uh, we are one of the largest investors in the world. We've invested in over 700 companies to date. Um, and uh, uh, we're also, you know, the number one investors in a, in a few things uh, in there. Uh, we invest across uh, several uh, themes. Hardware, of course, with Hacks. Um, we've invested in over 200 companies uh, in the hardware space, and this uh, hardware trends report is mainly based on our experience, of course. Um, we have also uh, invest deeply in life sciences um, through uh, a program called IndieBio, uh, which is based in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, we also have two other uh, focuses, uh, in China in particular, uh, and around food technology in New York uh, with uh, FoodX. Um, so our firm uh, was built by uh, uh, this man up there, uh, Sean O'Sullivan. I uh, joined the firm about seven years ago uh, to build the uh, accelerator practice. Um, and to date, uh, we've raised, uh, uh, we have about $300 million under asset management. Um, and uh, we also have uh, a new fund coming up uh, next year. Hacks itself has grown quite a bit. Uh, we started five years ago in China uh, with a seed stage program, uh, and uh, that's all that was there for, uh, for quite some time, uh, for about three years until I moved uh, to San Francisco a couple of years ago. Uh, for those of you who don't know yet, I'm based here, uh, so you can see me uh, anytime. Uh, we have an office uh, not too far from here um, on uh, Jesse Street nearby Powell, uh, where we run uh, a different uh, program, the growth stage program, because we essentially realized by graduating that many companies and taking them to market uh, that they needed some further help. Uh, and so we built a stack on top of the, the seed stage program, which remains in Shenzhen. So everything that is uh, prototyped to uh, production is in Shenzhen, 140 companies. Uh, you will see some of them today. Um, we just uh, graduated our uh, last uh, batch uh, last week in, in Asia, and we'll also have a demo day in September. Um, and our growth stage uh, has graduated about 68 companies uh, to date as well. Today we'll talk about hardware at large, and uh, it's becoming uh, extremely uh, 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 large, actually, uh, you know, and, and getting out of hand uh, between things that are B2C and things that are B2B. Um, we uh, have separated uh, essentially the industry into four pieces with the consumer, uh, the health, uh, the enterprise, and the uh, industrial. Um, and we're going to go through uh, all those four um, uh, uh, th themes here. Uh, we'll also talk a, a little bit about uh, the you know, investment scene. We'll talk about China in particular and the role it plays uh, in the hardware space. Um, and at the end of this presentation, we'll talk about the new opportunities that are coming up uh, for hardware companies, in particular regarding uh, public markets, uh, everything that is going on with the, with the Reg A uh, uh, plus uh, regulations, the Jobs Act and whatnot, which are actually changing quite a, quite a few things. So uh, for now, we'll get started with more general trends, uh, more startups, more high tech, um, uh, more things. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Benjamin Joff, who is a partner at Hacks, uh, to uh, present you uh, a few of those uh, things out there. Please welcome Ben. Thanks. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, so myself and Duncan are uh, based in Asia. We just flew in uh, like 
a few hours ago, <laughs> something like that. Um, but uh, it's a great pleasure to share, um, uh, I think, well, some of the, the trends we observe in Asia, but also concern the rest of the world. So to get started, I'll give a, a quick overview of like the, the major trends in, uh, in the hardware space before diving into each uh, separate topic. So first, I'd like to just highlight that this year is, is an important date because it's the 10 year anniversary of many of those pioneers, Fitbit, GoPro, DJI, all those companies are about 10 years old. And if you want to look about what's coming next, um, you need to see the companies that started in the past five years, the past two years, and this year uh, to, see, to see what's coming. And it's quite different, a uh, lot more high tech, and we're going to tell you more about it. Uh, I'd like to make a parallel because uh, we titled this presentation Steam Engine Time. So I'd like to do a quick review about the st history of Steam Engine. So for those of you, not familiar with, with the, the apparatus. Um, actually, Steam Engine has been around for a very long time, hundreds of years. Um, in 1712, there were already some engines able to pump water in mines, but they were quite costly. It was very difficult to use them in other places. And then Jim Swatt uh, came up with improvements that made it possible to apply to many other fields by improving the performance, improving the speed, improving the cost. So you got the steam engine, steam locomotive, the steamship, but also on another branch you got the printing press and even the penny press. So it was so much faster and cheaper that instead of selling a newspaper for six pennies, you could do it for one. And that increased tremendously the readership. Uh, that changed also the nature of news because you had, now you were touching different demographic and you had to find what interested them. So what could interest people for a penny? Well, it turns out that was the birth of the New York Times. So now in smart products, we're at a very similar crossroad. Like a few improvements happened in the hardware space with better prototyping tools, smartphones, access to cloud computing, access to low cost uh, processes, social media as a way to test your messages, your positioning even before you have any product, uh, pre sales platforms, uh, either on your own site or crowdfunding, access to low volume manufacturing, which is what the big reason why we have a base in Shenzhen, access to cheaper components and also access to alternative funding options. So all this makes it possible to have much more projects, much more companies getting started faster and cheaper with very innovative projects. Of course, like during the time of the steam engine, the industrial revolution, there will be a lot of attempts that won't work out, like those ones that didn't quite stick around. And we'll see, we'll see the same. So there's an explosion in product variety. Uh, there's much lower barriers of entry to create products. So you see diversity, you see segmentation of markets, you see personalization as an, a very important emerging trend and demand from customers, specialization of devices, and you also see rising complexity and some sort of uh, interest from con customers, both on the B2C and B2B, but also a little bit of a caution, caution because uh, of the question whether those products are gonna you know, still be around. Um, so investors get savvy about hardware, so we dived into hardware five years ago, uh, really heads in, and since then a few other investors have uh, followed those steps and uh, got into hardware as well as specialists. Uh, today probably every major fund has some hardware investments, uh, some of them you know, do one, two deals a year, some, uh, uh, some decide to grow uh, more than that. Uh, hardware accelerators have also popped up, so we were the first ones to start uh, in Shenzhen. Um, and then uh, a few others spread. You see Asia remains an important base for, for hardware. And um, there's still some challenges though for companies. Uh, the challenge, particularly with financing, because making things costs money. Actually so making software costs money too, but for some reason it seems to be less of a problem. Uh, in hardware, cash flow is king. You need to pay your factory first, and then you need to get money from your customers. So crowdfunding is really an exception when you get to market where the cash flow is very much in your favor. So companies try to leverage pre-sales, and when they go into retail, try to um, basically understand that it's all about people, it's all about paperwork, and it's all about patience. Financing the first production run is uh, the first production run is always a challenge. So the founder of PetCube, one of our investment, doing a technology for pets. Pets, part of uh, the family. I think they just crossed uh, how many devices they sold? Hundred thousand devices. 
So they sold quite a lot. Um, and um, yeah, manufacturing is capital intensive and you know, working with your manufacturing partners and with distribution partners can make all the difference in your cash flow. Uh, the, make, the community, uh, you probably heard of the maker movement, which was kind of the birth of all this. Actually, makers and startups, the gap is widening between the two. Um, from uh, last year, we actually shifted our attendance from Maker Fair to CES, where is now uh, the place for hardware startups to show their innovation. Uh, companies like 3D Robotics, who had deep roots in the maker movement, ended up um, doing consumer drones and then facing competition, particularly from DJI in China, now is doing B2B software. MakerBot got acquired and uh, they were a very big proponent of uh, domestic manufacturing made in New York and eventually after the acquisition shifted the supply chain to China as well. So CES is a very interesting proxy for innovation in hardware. Uh, you see here the number of exhibitors per country. And some countries actually have been rising very fast. France is one. And uh, Hax, even though not exactly a country, uh, is actually <laughs> presenting more companies than both Canada and Japan combined. Uh, in Eureka Park, so any of you went to CES? Raise your hand, so a few people, hardware, yeah, hardware people. There you go, so I'll see you at CES. Um, so in Eureka Park, you see the, the area dedicated to startups has been growing very fast. Uh, the, and this year was close to 600 startups presenting over there. Hacks alone had over 80 startups across the show in the different areas. Another thing that's interesting is to see how much funding has been reaching hardware startups. It's not necessarily talked about a lot, but all those companies you see here have raised over $100 million. The ones with a red highlight are Chinese companies. In the top five, four of them are Chinese. Two of them are less than two years old. So China dominates the top spots in hardware, and the number of companies that raised over $100 million has quadrupled in three years. There's today 17 hardware unicorns out of about 200 unicorns globally. So, you know, it's actually quite a significant category. The six on the left are Western unicorns. So four in US, one in France, one in Singapore, and Singapore US. Um, the five at the top are actually all part of the Xiaomi family. So Xiaomi invests in, in startups and give them distribution. And their reach is such that four companies that they invested in have already reached the unicorn status. So the mini-me, if you want. Um, and then the last six are other Chinese companies are doing different things. Those two are the bike rental companies and, uh, and a few others. So tech, and another trend that's interesting is to see that both tech and non-tech companies are actually eyeing hardware startups. Of course, the usual suspects, Apple, Facebook, Google, and others, are uh, acquiring companies uh, either to add a product line to their business or to acquire some technology. But you also see companies maybe a bit more unusual, like Fossil, the watchmaker, buying a wearable company, Electrolux, the, home, the kitchen appliance maker, buying a, a circulation cooker, Johnson & Johnson starting to buy electronics companies uh, for, to create digital therapeutics. And then they also invest. Samsung invested in a, in a competing company to Electrolux uh, called uh, Nomiku, also part of Hacks, actually. Uh, Beam Centauri, the liquor guys invested in a this typo here, uh, Bartesian, a cocktail machine, cocktail robot. So you see there's a lot happening here. And software giants, in addition to investing and acquiring, are also building their own hardware. Uh, from uh, Western companies, also Chinese companies like Tencent, Baidu, and JD.com are building their own hardware. Another challenge for hardware is how you deal with copycats. Uh, we in China, we're fairly familiar with that. Um, interestingly, actually, out of the 200 companies we invested in, none of them has really suffered from copycats. And the reason is because the intelligence is in the software. And software is hard to do by factories. So software is your best protection then trademarks, and then building a reputation and getting to market and to scale fast. Patents can help, obviously, to increase the value of the company, but as a young startup, it's generally very difficult to defend. And for medical devices, FDA certification can be, even when not required, a strategy to defend your business. 
IoT security getting pretty hot um, in uh, all sorts of aspects. So different pro different uh, products that had different problems. You probably heard of the Chrysler hack. So hacking your car, uh, web hacking webcams, uh, hacking even an uh, insulin pump, and a um, kid toy. So you see um, IoT will have to deal with uh, security quite seriously. Other interesting trend is connected devices actually attract insurance companies. Those are five different cases of um, device company teaming up with an insurance company for, uh, in this case, usage-based car insurance using an OBD system. Um, Liberty Mutual offered a free Nest Protect and even a rebate on your policy. Then you have uh, American Family uh, with the a ring, the, the smart doorbell, giving you also discounts. An activity travel, tracker given for free by John Hancock. And last but not least, um, Beam Dental is a smart toothbrush company that is actually becoming itself an insurance company. And this is actually quite surprising because IoT can be a Trojan horse for insurance and probably for more than that. This is a company that started as an IoT company and is becoming an insurance company itself. Hardware communities uh, that support all those startups and founders are growing. Uh, you see that uh, uh, India, the, the Bangalore uh, chapter called Applied Singularity is actually the one with the most members. Uh, second is London. Don't know what will happen with Brexit. Maybe that will go down. Maybe they'll go to France or something. Uh, <laughs> Um, San Francisco, obviously, uh, New York City, and then other locations like Israel and um, other in the top uh, the top communities, growing quite fast. All right, so I'll stop here for my section and I'll uh, hand it over to Kate, our program director in San Francisco. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Hi, everybody. I'm Kate Whitcomb. I run our growth program here in San Francisco. So some of you might have been to our office for meetups, that sort of thing. A lot of great familiar faces here. Um, I get to present the fun part of this presentation. So I'm going to talk through some consumer trends and some examples um, that will probably be familiar to a lot of you because we're kind of at that decade point with IoT where a lot of us have seen these products. And the great thing about consumer IoT is that we are all participants in it. Uh, many of the products that are on the market today we have purchased, we have bought as gifts, we use in our homes. So it's a familiar and very democratic category, which makes it more interesting. Um, some key, uh, a key trend that I think has popped up that's a, a very big deal in consumer IoT is that um, we're seeing that consumers are not buying products as sweets. Uh, about three years ago, a major theory was that people would buy products to link them all together in their homes, possibly under one brand name, and that consumers would be downloading if this, then that, buying multiple products, making it so that when they rang their smart doorbell or when they entered through their smart door lock, uh, their heat would turn on, their lights would turn a certain color, and the music would turn on. Well, that doesn't happen. Nobody buys things like that. We're seeing that people buy individual products that they want to buy for a certain purpose, and uh, they will not probably use them to link to other things unless it's through a voice platform. Um, given that, consumers are using an amazing platform called Amazon to buy many of their products. So who's sick of hearing about Amazon this week? Anybody? No? Great. Okay, we can go through this really, really fast. Um, but Amazon Launchpad has become a truly remarkable platform for consumers to buy products. And it's also become a great way for consumers to easily get access to startup products when they're ready to hit the market. Um, so if you combine Amazon Launchpad with uh, crowdfunding sites such as Kickstarter and Indiegogo, that combination makes a very great way for startups to go to market and to test product market fit very, very easily. So who here has bought something on Amazon Launchpad or backed a product on Kickstarter or Indiegogo this year? Probably just about everybody. Right, and that's the great thing about consumer technology is we're all kind of participating in that. And this is how startups today are testing product market fit, right? So they're able to figure out, do people want this? What do they like about it? Uh, what don't they like and what can I change? 
Um, that being said, there's a few very interesting um, and kind of outsized examples where this combination has not necessarily worked. These are all probably familiar to most of us who read TechCrunch on a regular basis. From Lily, um, Pebble, uh, just this past week, the Hello Sun Sleep Tracker, and then Scully. Um, interesting, I had a conversation with a higher ranking executive at Target this week about the Hello Sense product, which is actually in most Target stores and a number of other retailers. And examples like this do actually sort of um, hurt uh, the, the landscape for other startups. So that'll be interesting to see what happens from there. Um, retail buyers take risks when they take in startup products. So um, those types of kind of explosions really affect the whole marketplace. But that being said, the majority of campaign-backed products do not end this way. So the reality is that the examples um, are quite interesting and fun to read about, but they are an anomaly for the most part. Uh, the best thing about crowdfunding platforms is that the consumers are mostly quite friendly. So people are um, a little bit more understanding. They know they're not getting the product right away. They know it might not be perfect the first time. Um, so the reality is most products do ship or they're in progress and we'll see what happens. But the explosions are few and far between, which is great. Um, and at this point, although not perfect, and we all know this, that crowdfunding is not an indication of long-term success for a product, uh, at this point, it's the best place that hardware startups can get feedback um, in, a, in, a, in a space where there's very few ways for hardware companies to get rapid, rapid feedback from consumers. Kickstarter and Indiegogo have been the ultimate platforms for companies to test, will this actually work when we go into the real world? And we have a few examples of companies who have done a very, very good job with this. Um, the the first is TrainerBot, which is a, uh, a ping pong machine that lets you become an expert. I believe they claim in under 10 minutes. I've played it for 10 minutes and have not become an expert, but I had a really good time, so I do agree with that. Um, but they use YouTube communities to engage uh, their potential customers and figure out what people really liked about the product, and that let them kind of perfect it before their launch. A company called Mouser interviewed every single early backer with their interactive um, mouse cat toy to make sure that they were doing things that people actually wanted the product to do. Um, Volterra, chip printing product, um, similarly uh, used their backers to help beta test. Uh, same with FlickTech, who did a fairly large pivot. Um, the company called Anova, who has a smart sous vide product that was recently purchased by Electrolux for $250 million. Um, their founding team says that one of their uh, kind of key advantages is that after they launched their first version, they did, I believe, 50 plus home visits to see what people liked about the product and how they were using it. So when they launched a V2 of that product, they were able to take that feedback from people's kitchens to launch it effectively. And if you look at their Amazon reviews, you'll see how that's reflected. People actually like the product because they were involved in the development, which is pretty exciting. Um, a few examples, I'm just going to go through three quick examples of how um, slightly more successful products have actually gone to market. The first is MakeBlock, which is one of our investments. Um, MakeBlock uh, started in, with humble beginnings. They raised $185,000 in 2012 to help uh, back their STEM toy platform. Um, they've, si they've since hired 400 staff. They've raised $36 million. They have dedicated stores selling MakeBlock product in China. They're now launching in the US. And and they're still using kick Kickstarter for market validation. So they recently did another uh, project called Neuron, which completed, I think, a $380,000 Kickstarter campaign a few months ago. Um, but they're continuing to use that as a way to get market validation, which is pretty impressive. Um, another good example um, of another hacks inv investment is the Octopus smartwatch by Joy. And this is the kids smartwatch that teaches kids good habits. And they took a very interesting path to market. Um, they executed a Kickstarter campaign, did quite a bit of marketing, and then before they even shipped their Kickstarter campaign, they started pitching retailers. And this is a path that we encourage in our growth program in San Francisco. As soon as the company has a final prototype to show, we encourage those teams to start the sales process. So to start pitching buyers, getting feedback, getting on the market, we know that retail sales cycles are very, very long. And Joy took advantage of that by going to market and pitching as quickly as possible. And actually, this summer, Joy will be in um, hundreds and hundreds of Target stores. That'll be exciting when that actually happens. So that's a great example of moving quickly, taking feedback from customers, and launching as fast as possible. 
Um, another great example, and this is kind of the flip side of things, is um, getting Richard Branson money. That really helps. So if you, if you are able to do that, uh, you can grow very, very quickly. And Ring has been a great example of this. The uh, video doorbell market was a highly competitive space a few years ago. Ring went to market very quickly and actually was one of the first IoT products to advertise on TV. So before Alexa was advertising on TV, Ring doorbell, uh, I believe, actually had a Super Bowl ad. Um, but after raising a lot of VC money, being in every retail store in America, what they're actually doing is pivoting to becoming a security company. So as Ben mentioned before, this is a very interesting space for consumer products as they broaden their reach and uh, penetrate our households to actually think about what's next. How do we become a platform that truly uh, changes how people live their everyday lives? Um, so those are uh, some examples of um, consumer tech companies. And over to Ben again to get into some deeper technology. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. So those are examples that are a little bit more unusual than the ones we, we generally hear about in the media. Um, and uh, we think that's really what's happening is that every consumer product is being reinvented with technology. And you see things, not just connectivity, but actually equipping with sensors. Uh, you see demand for personalization using technology and devices that are specialized and becoming intelligent. So probably one of the best examples of that is those three products that all have basically the equivalent of a smartphone inside in terms of a level of sophistication. And that allows to do a lot more onboard processing and a lot more, let's say, faster response on, the, on smarter, smarter things. So those, those two cameras here are able to do uh, a large part of the, the face recognition onboard um, by just uh, analyzing already the image. And then they can connect to the database with the, the data they, they analyzed. Um, obviously, voice agents are also booming. Um, from uh, those looking a little bit strange to uh, those looking a bit more normal. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's spreading. It's really like getting intelligence into objects. And that could be intelligence in the form of AI, but also intelligence in the form of coaching. For example, those three sports tech companies actually have some kind of a digital coach. So in the case of Peloton, which is one of the recently minted unicorns after raising $444 million, would be a very bad number in China, even though more. Anyway, uh, so they, they do video streaming of uh, spinning classes. Another company, th those two were actually invested in, one is a ski tech company called Carve uh, that provides audio cues based on the analysis of sensors inside your ski boot uh, that can recognize not only your orientation, uh, the orientation of your skis, but as, uh, also the pressure on your posture on the skis. So you get real-time coaching. And TrainerBot is a robot training you. Even toys are getting smarter. Um, Anki uh, raised quite a bit of money uh, to create a very in intelligent and advanced toy. Recently, DJI released their first kind of consumer um, level product. So uh, cheaper than the thousands of dollars you pay for the other ones. Uh, that allows to do gesture control, so you don't need a cumbersome remote. You don't need to be a pilot to actually interact with your drone. Um, and Another big trend is the personalization is becoming the new normal. And obviously, making a million different products from the factory is very difficult. So what's happening is personalization, personalization in aftermarket. And there's different examples of that. For example, the first one, this company called Revels, making earphones that can custom fit to your ears after you buy them. Uh, Orenda is a coffee machine that can adapt to your taste, that you can actually control the brewing process and, uh, and have the perfect coffee for, you, uh, for your taste. Neura uh, has headphones that can tune to your unique hearing, hearing profile. Uh, to just show you quickly how Revels works, really the invention is uh, in the material science field. So you have a gel inside the silicon sleeve, you place it in your ear, it takes the shape, and then you press a button on your smartphone, and within a minute it's set, and you have perfectly fit custom earphones. Another trend in, uh, in, in terms of having intelligence is intelligence in the kitchen is really trying to bring professionals into your home to make you coffee, make you cook your food, make you a cocktail, or make you a fantastic pressed juice. So the, what's interesting here is that it's not uh, driven by the desire of customers for quality experiences at home. There's also opportunities to create uh, interesting business models around recurring revenue. So, you know, razor, razor blade, uh, Nespresso, Keurig. Obviously, it doesn't always work. Sometimes it backfires. Uh, Juicero had a little bit of a hiccup 
on the way. Um, it was a dream for investors, really, like super high tech, consumables, recurring revenue, fantastic. But maybe it was a little bit of a spec for the job, slightly, and uh, it looks like customers didn't really react so well to the idea of DRM on veg. And um, the fact that there's a double lock-in first that you need to purchase from them, so that's kind of an espresso model, that's familiar, but that if you don't have internet, maybe it doesn't work, that, that's a little bit more unfamiliar. Um, robots also right the corner, uh, actually they've been around for a while, um, so Roomba has been around literally right the corner. Uh, the wind bot cleans your windows, uh, you have now a flurry of robots that can mow your lawn, uh, and uh, the stock of uh, iRobot, the maker of the Roomba, is actually through the roof in the past uh, year, year or so. Uh, so the first wave is really quite mature now and is doing very well, but robots are still very, doing very basic tasks and are not very intelligent. We're not there yet at the stage where you can you know, tell the Roomba, go, kit, go clean the kitchen floor. So it doesn't work that way. You need smarter robots. So let me introduce you a smarter robot. It was designed in 2011 by a company called Willow Garage, very famous for having created the operating system for robot, ROS. And you can see what the robot is doing is locating a target, scooping a target very precisely. And, uh, you know, seems to be working pretty well. The only problem is that it costs $400,000. <laughs> Aside from that, it's fantastic. Um, and really, that's really what the, the problem is. Uh, you want, what you want is a robot more like this. You want a robot that costs $400, similar to your Roomba, and can do the same job. And how is that possible? Well, it's possible because since 2011, now you have low-cost sensors. You, have you can create a dedicated shape instead of using you know, a humanoid C3PO type of robot, and you can use cloud computing. So the new robot is literally a thousand times cheaper than six years ago. Um, mentioning about uh, like recent, like, uh, quite hyped up categories, virtual reality, so there's a big push towards standalone for better user experience. The challenges remain around uh, the CPU, the battery life, the ability to track your environment without having to set up all sorts of things around you. Um, another challenge of virtual reality uh, when you want to use uh, like real life footage is to have something really immersive, because you have 360 cameras, but it really, what makes a difference, and you probably know that for, from any Skype call, is the sound. Uh, and to get the sound in 3D, you need actually much more than one or two microphones. So this, uh, this company called Sonicam, uh, we invested in recently, has 64 tiny microphones on, its, on, its, uh, um, on, on the device to be able to map 3D immersive sound. Uh, the other challenge of VR is around uh, interactions. Uh, if you don't want to be like, uh, you know, waving joysticks and uh, not seeing what's going on around you and uh, not basically having an unnatural interaction, you need to be able to track the gaze or track the hands for natural interactions. So that's coming as well. Uh, this is actually from a company called Leap Motion, which was an early SOSV uh, hacks investment. Um, smart glasses, I uh, guess all of you uh, know of that. Uh, maybe some of you have had the, the chance to try a few. Um, the first, let's say, like the first wave wasn't very successful, but uh, was good at exploring uh, concepts on usability. And now you see a second wave with kind of different functions that seem to be much more pragmatic and um, also much more focused on the uh, acceptance of customers on the daily life usage. And to close uh, that section, I will just mention uh, a quick, uh, quick device, um, because we see a lot of those in China, uh, those personal mobility devices. So hoverboards, the one where you tilt your feet and catch fire, those ones are so last year. Uh, this year is all about things like this, nine bots. Uh, you have also the one wheel thing. Uh, I saw people outside on electric scooters, on uh, electric uh, skateboards. Those are the really, like, not the jet packs, but really the practical devices we we're going to use. Nine bots um, already sold a million of those since the beginning of last year. And they also acquired Segway, with, with, with whom they had a little bit of a, you know, patent issues, but looks like it's solved. Um, and uh, what's interesting that this company, a uh, Chinese company, is doing very well, uh, not only in China, but also abroad. And uh, for the founders who join us in our program in Shenzhen, generally when they arrive, they get a SIM card, they get a VPN, and very quickly after, they get a 9-bot. 
and they know they can't ship it back, or it's going to be costing them quite a bit of money, they, they just want to enjoy it for a few months, commuting, fooling around, and sometimes getting into uh, dangerous accidents by fooling too much. Uh, all right, so that's uh, enough for the deep tech session, uh, section, and uh, I'll pass on the mic to Duncan. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> yeah, so if you do ever come to the Hack Show Engine offices where I'm based, these are banned. We'll take them off you as you come in through the door because they've caused so many incidents. Um, so um, a lot of people, when they, when they think about hacks, um, they automatically think about consumer. Um, but actually, that's not really so much so the case these days. And we've heard a certain kind of shift away from um, consumer tech over the past three years, kind of roughly when I joined. And um, <clears throat> started to explore more of health, enterprise, and industry or industrial investments. And um, if you look actually at 2016, which was the last year, you'll notice that health has become our largest category. So now for that year represents the largest part of our portfolio. And it's an area that we're really passionate about, and so something I just wanted to talk a little bit about today. Um, we basically invest across two different areas, either consumer health, that's non-regulated stuff, things that don't really need an FDA stamp, also all the way up to full medical um, devices, FDA certified, etc. The reason we find this area so exciting to invest in at the moment is because there's huge potential in what's commonly being known as kind of the P4 of medicine. This idea is basically that we're going to have all this sensing technology around us. It's going to know a lot more about our bodies than, ever, than we ever did before. And so we can basically predict ahead of time when we're going to get ill. We can have kind of preventative measures um, based on software, which is kind of gaining information from hardware. Um, we can then offer people personalized um, solutions. So for example, we know that somebody likes skipping. Well, guess what? You can skip an extra 30 times and your blood pressure will go down. That kind of um, suggestions will be available for people. And <clears throat> having lots of data from somebody means that people can then participate, give their data back, so that we can learn more and more and build better and better software, um, artificial intelligence, to help us know more and more about um, disease. This is a massive opportunity for hardware, because hardware and sensing technology is basically the best way to get a load of really good quality data. And artificial intelligence is based on really good data, so the better data we have from sensing technologies, the better AI we have. And a number of our companies are doing this already. Like, There's just some medical devices we've invested in that, for example, um, are taking a variety of different measurements from your blood. This is BBB on the top. They take 50 different markers from a pinprick, give you kind of a full lipid analysis, and then also different markers in the blood to basically give you an idea of how and when you're likely to get certain illnesses. On the bottom is a company that similarly do blood tests, but they actually just geotag those to help um, companies prevent disease by understanding how a certain new disease might be moving in an area. Obviously, this data is very valuable. Everybody thinks about medical devices for data, but actually, consumer devices are just as important. It's an interesting trend that we're seeing. Ben mentioned earlier we had this fantastic company called Neuro. They customize the sound to give you the perfect kind of sound, the perfect music whenever you play them. And the way they do that is they basically play a set of signals into the ear when you put them on and, um, and set them up for the first time. And it analyzes exactly your susceptance to high, medium, and low tones. That means that they can create the cu custom sound for you, which is exactly right for your hearing profile. But over time, what they're doing is basically building a catalog of how our hearing is changing, which has never been able to be done before until, until products like this come out. And really, nobody's going to actually put a bit of technology in their ear just so that somebody can get that data. But these kind of consumer Trojan horses are gathering this interesting data through giving the customers something they really want, which is customized sound. Now, those are interesting in their each kind of siloed um, cases. When you start to pull things together, you can do things like this. Like this company on the left actually measures concentration. So you put a set of headphones on and then work away on, 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 on your day's activities. It'll tell you when you start to get distracted. If you then compare that data with how you slept or what you ate or how hydrated you were during the day, you start to build these incredibly interesting data sets, which we're really excited about for the future. But it's going to be tough. People don't want to donate data, which I don't really understand. I had actually somebody in an audience once we were talking about health data. They were like, hey, you can't sell your data. It's private. I'm like, do you donate organs when you die? Well, yeah, then you should donate your data. It's helping us to be much healthier in the future. 
Um, but it's a massive challenge. Obviously, there's a huge gathering of data is a big, big problem. Um, there's a privacy issue, which really we want to kind of make sure somehow gets legislated so that people don't actually hold on to their data. And then there's problems around normalizing this and then making sure that it's personalized for people so that they understand all of the feedback that they get. There are a number of initiatives already starting to happen, particularly the European Science Cloud, trying to kind of start to gather all this data to make it available for scientists. This is all good for startups, but actually it's still a tough place for medical device and health device companies, because people want evidence of what you can do. If you say you can help someone sleep better, people want evidence of that. We had two interesting companies um, came through the program. One's called Leaf. Um, they're on the right. They basically have a device which helps people understand if they're about to have um, an episode of anxiety attack. They do that by a simple um, kind of sticker that you put just underneath the heart to give you um, electrocardiogram um, information. Now, that's a very difficult path to go down to get that clinically validated. So what they ended up doing is delivering a Kickstarter for around $400,000, um, which they'll then ship out to people, and that will help them start their commercialization route, help them to start gathering data so that they can then eventually apply themselves to, to medical devices. On the other hand, we had another company that had done a huge amount of um, testing around their sleep mask. There are hundreds of sleep masks out there in the world, and so they decided rather than launching a consumer product, they're going to go straight to FDA first to set themselves apart from the rest of the, um, of the market and then create the, you know, something which really seemed like it was validated by the medical professionals to help them to sell. Sleep is a huge market, and it's one that a number of our startups have attacked, be it using sound, light, or temperature. All of these kind of different um, variables that you can put on the body are clinically proven to be able to help people sleep better. And exposing people to that and actually helping them to get their sleep to be better and more effective is a threat to pharma and something which we find incredibly exciting as an investment area. There's other areas that we look at, for example, back pain. Back pain is the single biggest cost in, um, in the medical healthcare. We've invested in anything from a non-activity tracker on the left, it just measures how long you're sitting for and how well you're sitting, to a device which helps you to understand how you're recovering from back pain to give psycho uh, sorry, physiotherapists remote access to you and to give you remote, remote training, all the way up to class three surgically implanted medical devices on the right, which can help to uh, regrow bones in the, in the spine after a surgery. Other areas we looked at are depression, we've put a number of different investments in the area from logging in a different emotion to actually helping with transcranial and ultrasound stimulation to actually change the way the brain thinks. And areas like getting pregnant. Um, we've invested in three different companies that help women understand how fertile they are, men understand how fertile they are, and then tracking the, the baby when it's actually inside the womb. And there's plenty more. There's literally probably a hundred different um, areas of opportunity that we could look to, and by kind of combining all of these investments that we're making into healthcare devices, we're really trying to create this kind of unique data set to help scientists and to help medical practitioners to make us live better lives. The other area I want to talk about was enterprise and industry. Um, and I've kind of clumped these together because they're a little bit difficult to um, separate out. But essentially, enterprise investments are really kind of, you know, the standard of, of which most of you know is IoT, like industrial IoT. Um, it's basically taking um, data from areas that didn't already exist and then applying it to a real world situation where then there's a huge amount of revenue to gain. We've seen companies um, use data as a new oil, like the mining industry, um, the agriculture industry, profits hugely from new understanding about how the different conditions will affect the output of wherever they are. So here are some, here are some examples of areas that are profiting really well with startups. Um, anything from mining industries to power companies, agriculture and logistics. I always like to talk about mining because mining actually really started the IoT movement. Rio Tinto um, have now done something like four million kilometers traveled with autonomous um, um, trucks that are carrying ore around their um, different mines. Um, they use those trucks and they also use sensing devices to make sure that they're getting the most out of the ore in the ground and making sure that they're able to process and control the, um, the, the mining situation in a way which is most profitable for them. 
That's meant they've invested a huge amount of connected mining um, solutions, and startups are helping to, helping them to do that. It's estimated that the the uh, market for connected mines is going to be 3.8 billion dollars this year. Sorry, last year, and goes up to 10 billion dollars in 2020. These are all just startups helping mining mining um, companies to enhance the production through understanding more about what's going on under the ground. Now, Kate mentioned earlier that people don't really actually um, follow this notion of connecting together smart home devices into something which kind of provides a huge amount of value. And a lot of the investments in smart homes actually looked a little bit dumb until recently. Um, and um, that's because what we didn't realize, only started to realize recently, is that smart home investments actually make a lot of sense for utility companies who are currently paying for a lot of companies to have um, technologies going into the home which are either saving energy or helping them to run their their grids more efficiently for example um, nest um, users get paid between 30 and 50 dollars per year to be able to connect to certain utility companies so that they can off offload the grid when there's too much power on and just basically cool down the house to get rid of a load of power that's in the grid. We've got another company in our last batch called Volt Storage. They created a battery um, solution, a technology, a new type of battery technology called Vanadium Redox Flow, which does exactly this. It's basically like a load of like a matrix of little capacitors all around the world, which means that you can easily drain the power, the power grid from excess power, which helps the power power companies to reduce their um, wastage. And company, uh, utility companies are constantly looking to, to basically find new revenue streams and new ways to save energy. Um, they're under pressure from the governments always to reduce the amount of energy that they're, that they're spending. So if you, for example, if you look at the amount of energy you spend just in the homes for residential AC in America is $29 billion. Even just a fraction of a percent of savings on that is huge for the um, utility companies. And that's why a lot of utility companies have started to pair up with the companies that we've invested in at Hacks. Agriculture is also a very interesting area for us. Um, we've kind of reached this strange point whereby we expanded up until 2015 or 2013 the amount of land that we could actually farm from. And now we're at a point where we need to get more and more productive with that because by 2050, we're going to need 70% more food than we have available at the moment. And so there's a bunch of companies that are looking at this space, anything from tracking livestock to make sure that livestock is becoming more productive, making sure that, they're, um, that we're breeding livestock in the right way, to new sensing technologies, which are enabling us to manage these, um, the agriculture that we have better. These are three different companies that we found that are using hyperspectral sensing to basically know when a crop is at the time at which it should be um, um, harvested, or when it needs more water, or when it's about to be, get spoiled. Similarly, there's a whole range of different companies um, um, looking at um, agriculture to understand kind of how some of the um, Conditions such as um, such as temperature and rain are going to affect the crops in the future, and companies that are even just monitoring crops once they've been picked, once they've been harvested. So this this company called Amber um, Agriculture came through our last batch. They're a sensing device which just goes into a corn storage silo like these things over here, and tells you exactly what the state of the corn is, which can go up and down by 10% based on the moisture content or spoilage that might happen um, when it's being stored. A large amount of investment has gone into this, um, into this area to kind of solve this food crisis that we have. Um, some big indoor growing companies have taken the majority of the funding, like $90 million and $60 million, essentially just to grow in a metropolitan area, grows um, high value crops such as rocket, or, sorry, arugula, um, and other vegetables. Now, it's interesting, we've seen, we've seen this happen in the, um, in the commercial space. We've then also seen a bunch of startups try to do that in the, in the home space. So try to basically take this same philosophy of, out, of indoor growing and then grow things in a cabinet. It doesn't really work. Um, it's, there's, you don't get anywhere near enough the efficiency that you do from, um, from a large space. 
One that did work, though, was a company that came through our program who don't use any light at all. They actually just grow um, insect protein for human consumption inside this little hive. So it's kind of like cricket bugs grow inside that hive off um, kitchen scraps, and they can produce around half a kilo of protein per week just from the waste from your kitchen. And it tastes fantastic. I know some of you are looking like, the hell are you talking about? It is really it good. Is. Can anyone, anyone has had the steam? I know you have. What, what do you think? think? Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there, was, there is one indoor growing company that did particularly well that came through our program, and that was growing food of a different kind. Um, um, but this cannabis um, area really is the only one which we think actually at the moment is high value enough to, to kind of get this sort of technology into the home. Of course, robotics help agriculture a lot. There's a huge amount of investments from companies like Blue River who are basically going around seeding and also picking um, agricultural produce. And robots have gone into other areas such as automation. Um, everybody knows about Amazon um, creating, and sorry, they didn't create, they acquired Kiva some time ago now, which has enabled them to create a huge amount of jobs. Um, you know, in November 2014, 15,000 robots and something like 20,000 jobs, and then that's kept scaling and scaling and scaling. Did anyone see the Chinese version of this? Somewhat chaotic and incredibly fast yet. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure it's very efficient as well. Um, <laughs> these, um, these technologies are just going to be, you know, everywhere all around us, and it's not a consumer piece of technology. It doesn't go onto Kickstarter. But you know what, I, I actually find this stuff kind of really exciting. Now, you might not have a big warehouse to be able to make a huge kind of um, infrastructure, but there are companies that are creating smaller robotics, which are standalone, which can help to be integrated into an existing um, situation. I think one of my favorites, though, was this from a batch a couple of, no, about a year ago now, called Symbi Robotics. Um, they created the world's first kind of shelf auditing robot, which basically runs around a supermarket and gives you a full stock analysis of things that are, out, that are in the wrong place, have a pricing error or out of stock so that retailers can start to be much more intelligent about marketing and understanding what's selling in, on, the shops, on the shop floor. I'm not going to talk about autonomous cars because it's boring and everybody talks about it, but everybody's fighting over it. It seems like Google's probably winning. The next big one is autonomous delivery. So there's a huge amount of, co of companies starting to invest in this space. We've had a couple come through hacks, and um, it's something that we're constantly watching out for. And just finally, industry. So we're based in, uh, we're based in China. I'm British, hence the uh, Brexit joke that always gets given to me. And um, there's, something, there's, there's something really interesting going on right now, actually, in industry. So obviously, the first industrial revolution was in Britain, yes. Um, and. Um, <laughs> And, and, and since then, people followed on, like went through Central Europe, Japan, USA, China. Um, every step that we had in Industrial Revolution, they never, the Industrial Revolution never left those areas. All those countries carried on producing. In fact, it wasn't that long ago that the US was, um, more, um, was, was producing more than China. I think it was like early 2000s. Um, but what's really interesting is that market forces around labor have always driven those changes. So at every point, it's always been a reduced labor cost, which has enabled um, manufacturing to change. Now we're in this really weird place. So we're, we're, now, at, we're now at China. Obviously, everything's made in China. And um, you kind of wonder where next, right? And um, actually, nowhere, basically. <laughs> um, because robots are coming in to take over the majority of the manufacturing processes. And so what you've got is this interesting situation where China has suddenly started to invest in a huge um, capacity in manufacturing robotics. So is Central Europe. And ironically, Japan, leaving USA and Britain, I don't know where they are, but I guess we'll probably be last. Um, um, but, but basically it means there's a huge amount of value in, in manufacturing, which will be retained in those companies, simply through the fact that they've invested in robotics first. So China's got all sorts of things going on at the moment. They've got this Mans for Machine program. It's not highly publicized. Um, the figures here are actually a lot lower than they are, but we know that just in the area where we are based, in Dongguan, um, they had a plan to replace 87,000 workers just within one short time period. There's another area close to us which uh, have got, put around $3 billion of grants into making, taking jobs from manual workers and then putting them into the, into the hands of a robot. 
And currently, there's around a million factory robots in, in China. That's forecast to be 5 million by 2020. I actually think that's going to be way higher. Manufacturing is changing. What's interesting is you know, you're, we're starting to see a kind of an evolution from what was pro, what promised as this amazing world of 3D printing, which is going to revolutionize things, never really happened. Well, actually, now it's starting to finally happen. You do have manufacturing uh, manufacturers that are 3D printing farms. There are incredible bits of software like this in, in topology. Um, that basically allow you to do things with 3D printing that you just simply cannot do with any other process. And you know, it's interesting to see how this kind of transition from like a maker kind of technology has kind of come all the way into a very high tech manufacturing process, which I believe will be um, pretty much everywhere in the not too distant future. And that kind of gets me thinking, you know, there's all these, you know, these previous generation maker tools that have turned into now generation um, manufacturing technologies. What about the maker tools that are happening at the moment, like this? This is a, um, a company called Volterra. They're a PCB printer. Basically, they help people to prototype a PCB in 20 minutes by doing a um, s silver nanoparticle liquid deposit of, um, of wires onto a PCB. That type of technology right now is great for makers. It's a small market. But very soon, when they've developed it, could be fantastic for distributed manufacturing. Same as this, one of the companies that came through CACs last year, they're a water jet cutter. Basically, they use an old technology, which has been around for years in huge industrial applications, and then just put it down onto a desktop so you can cut pretty much any material up to four millimeters thick. So you can cut through ceramic, titanium, glass, pretty much anything. These types of technology are very exciting for us. It's an investment thesis we have, and we look forward to the fact that someday they may be integrated into manufacturing. And what's really interesting is almost all of those started on Kickstarter. So even though it is a predominantly a consumer platform, it would be interesting to see what technologies come out of that in the future. And now we're going to hand over to Ben, I believe. Thank you. Thanks. So that was Duncan. He's the managing director of the program in Shenzhen and uh, general partner at uh, SOSB. So uh, since we came all the way from China, we thought we'd bring a little bit of a piece of China with us. Uh, so here's uh, some ideas about what uh, some of you might not be f too familiar about, um, because uh, there's general bias around news, uh, Chinese news in the West. So this is more about what's happening on the ground. Um, and the idea is really that China is evolving as not just the, the kind of copycat image, but also is evolving toward being a, an innovator at very high speed. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with this fidget cube that we could actually acquire on a Taobao for a dollar or two before it, it was uh, even produced by the Kickstarter creators. Um, so the first phenomenon alongside, uh, it's, not just cop it's not copycatting, it's more like fast speed commoditization. So we call that Xiaomiization, because Xiaomi is investing in lots of companies, invested in 77 companies, four of them became unicorns, and they shipped already 30 different products, and those companies are doing very well, because they're selling through Xiaomi. Uh, Xiaomi has a very popular online platform, it's like kind of its own e-commerce site, and those companies are reaching very significant revenues, and the other thing is that they're actually driving a lot of people out of business. When they launch their activity tracker for $13, with almost the same type of features as a Fitbit and 30 days autonomy, well, suddenly uh, it became clear that Fitbit wouldn't probably make a dent in the Chinese market. But then Xiaomi started to sell those products also outside. So Xiaomiization continues. Um, what's interesting is also seeing some crossover project, uh, products. Uh, for example, um, just like voice control is booming in the West, well, that's a very big topic in, uh, in Asia. And, What's interesting is that Lenovo, a Chinese company, is actually using Alexa to put to their own speakers and selling it globally. So um, it's estimated that by the end of the year, China will have dozens of similar like, voice-based products using either Alexa or some local technologies. Um, if you're wondering if China is an innovator, um, well, let's try to find an objective measure. Uh, how about patents? Well, it turns out that China this year is going to probably overtake Japan as the second uh, most active um, uh, country for patents. So of course, uh, we can always change, like break the thermometer and say, oh, this is not a valid metric. But well, still counts. Uh, they're actually the two companies in the world that filed the most patents are Chinese. 
ZTE and Huawei. Shenzhen, where, we, where we're based, uh, is now quite firmly on the map. Maybe some of you saw the documentary by Wired that uh, talks about uh, Shenzhen, the Silicon Valley for hardware. You know, similar way that people come to Silicon Valley to get in, uh, to take advantage of the ecosystem, or if you, I don't know, you study fashion, you go to Paris, Milan, or New York. If you want to do hardware, you go to Shenzhen, and you have guys like this guy, Scotty Allen, who decided to build his own iPhone. Went to the market and bought each component one by one, like modules type of, type of base, and then eventually managed to reassemble an iPhone 6S from scratch. So this is possible in the market. And beyond the market of components, there's also there's the ecosystem of thousands and tens of thousands of factories all around that make everything from plastic to advanced electronics. Uh, so it's a magnet. Uh, we see so many people come through our door, uh, visits uh, from uh, uh, CEOs, ministers, and of course a lot of startups. Um, even top universities and MNCs are starting research centers in Shenzhen. Uh, Apple actually started their second research center. They had a first one for software, and now they also have uh, for hardware, they used to already send the executives to work within the factory to do more advanced prototyping, to do fast cycles and fast iteration. The advantage of China, contrary to what a lot of people think, is not, is not cost, it's not only cost, it's actually speed. China works at startup speed, everybody's on WeChat, you get messages in and out from your suppliers on a Sunday, a Sunday night, they ship the component in the morning, it's non-stop and it's very, very, very fast. Um, so next is uh, investment, so talking about uh, startups, actually China has been surging dramatically since uh, 2014 where it was you know, a fraction of, uh, of the, the US investment and about uh, the same size as, um, as, uh, as Europe. But on uh, the first quarter of this year, China is actually two thirds of, uh, of US investments in terms of, uh, of amount and it's three times uh, more than Europe. Sadly, Japan, where I used to live for a while, uh, is barely noticeable there. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, they wake up at some point. Um, so the market in China, with all this investment money uh, poured in, is actually uh, heating up at every stage. Uh, one of the most famous investors uh, at the seed stage, Xu Xiaoping, founder of a gen fund, uh, says that there's basically an overflow of funding, especially at angel funding, which is his stage. Uh, but actually, if you look at the data, um, it's at a lot of stages where there's actually a lot of money. Um, this is the size, the, the median size of pre-money valuation for first, second, and later round. And what's actually kind of crazy is that the Chinese rounds for the first and the later rounds are about three times larger than in the US. So there's overflow at the angel stage and the seed stage. At the early growth stage, well, comparable. On later rounds, actually China does mega rounds because they, a lot of investors believe that it has to be um, basically an all-out war. You have to win the market very quickly. And what's interesting is that some of those companies who get lots of funding, uh, like for example, in the current rental frenzy, uh, uh, companies like Ofo on Mobike, uh, we do those uh, dockless bi bikes, uh, raise hundreds of millions. And it's very possible that down the road, they might actually do a mega merger that already happened a few times in China. Uh, you have other companies like this uh, battery charger, umbre uh, like a battery rental, umbrella rental, and even basketball rental. Everything is rentable. Um, China also actually leads in VR uh, in a way because they've deployed a lot of VR arcades uh, for young people and older people to have fun. Um, and uh, thousands are already opened. So I don't know if uh, you're current on the Silicon Valley series, but. Uh, that's from the last one. Um, global leaders are emerging also from China. Uh, of course, DJI, everyone knows in the drone space, but Ninebot is a unicorn. UB Tech, uh, consumer robot, is a unicorn. Megblock and Insta360, 360, 360 camera, are on the way. Um, so in, in terms of innovation, China today is like Japan in the 80s, like incredibly creative, incredibly fast. And more are coming, such as uh, uh, three companies, two, the first two we, we are investors in. So the 360 camera, Elephant Robotics, a very interesting uh, um, industry robotic company, because not only they do a low cost six degrees robot arm, so they can do a lot of things uh, useful in factories, but they're actually associated with computer vision, so the robot can actually do more. 
and they're much easier to, to uh, program, and uh, they're already in a pilot with a very large automotive equipment manufacturer. Uh, Mobvoi is a China-focused company that uh, is uh, developing uh, uh, basically software and intelligence for voice control, a little bit like uh, Alexa, Siri, but uh, ch China-focused. So cutting-edge Chinese startups are going to emerge. Uh, we'll see more and more become global players, even if the majority will probably focus on the very large domestic market. And for the companies who can't innovate that much, well, you know, there's other options. Uh, for example, Meida, uh, appliance maker, you know, they realized that they were using so many robots, like Duncan mentioned, um, that they were paying a lot of money to buy them. So they decided to buy the company making the robots. And uh, sadly for uh, Ms. Merkel and uh, Mr. Obama, this company now uh, that used to be German is not Chinese. Um, if you buy, uh, you can buy innovation, but sometimes people don't care so much about technology. They want something that actually looks nice. But you can also buy that. Uh, Xiaomi worked with Philip Stark to design the latest phone, the kind of edgeless screen uh, called the Mi Mix. So that's uh, all for China. Hopefully, uh, there will be some uh, some interesting tidbits in there, and I'll uh, pass on the mic to, uh, to uh, for the last section to Cyril. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so we're gonna conclude very quickly with, uh, you know, essentially the end of the journey because uh, you've seen that those companies are getting started. Uh, some of them are, are growing pretty drastically. Um, and uh, essentially we have a new wave of, uh, of companies coming up to maturity. Uh, some of those already have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue uh, as, as we've seen. So what's, what's gonna happen next is, uh, is for everybody's guess, but um, there is a lot of activity at um, uh, somewhat uh, late stage uh, companies here. We all know that you know VCs are still somewhat cautious with, with hardware. Um, there have been you know some some progresses I think over uh, over the year, but uh, it's still uh, still the rule. Uh, hardware costs money, uh, and uh, and financing hasn't been really uh, solved yet. But um, that leads to, to caution here. Um, but one of the advantages that all the, those hardware companies have is revenue. Uh, essentially, they are businesses. They need to survive, and uh, they need to sell things, uh, and in return they get money, which is uh, I know fairly amazing for uh, you know any company uh, uh, around here, um, uh, but that's that's very useful. Uh, and uh, essentially, some of them can manage to, to get to, to growth. We've seen those uh, you know early stages um, pre-revenue distribution platforms coming up. Um, of course, uh, nowadays we have Amazon, and uh, more and more of those uh, distribution hiccups are uh, getting fixed by the day. Um, and uh, we also know that growth and profit attracts different kinds of investors. And uh, actually, I think in in the room there are probably um, uh, some people from the investment banking world here um, looking at what's going on. Um, and uh, at the same time, the public markets um, and other uh, funding options are, are being open. So let's look at a few um, uh, examples here um, and also uh, you know, wonder what, what's, what's going on and why, why will you go public uh, if you are a hardware company? Uh, well, actually, uh, it's interesting, but um, uh, I started to receive lots of different types of calls uh, from clients of, uh, or startups asking me about Hey, I'm about to cut a million dollar uh, check uh, to buy, you know, ten robots from uh, from your, you know, uh, from a company from your portfolio. Uh, are they legit? Uh, and uh, of course, yes. You know, they, they only have ten thousand dollars left in their bank account, uh, but uh, it's all good. You know, it's gonna be good. It's gonna go fine. But uh, you, you see, kind of the limit of the exercise very quickly uh, as those companies are maturing, and uh, and and you know, there, there needs to, uh, they will need to have some some transparency here for them to to grow um, at you know certain uh, caps um, and. We've seen companies go public. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, the, you know, somewhat of the, the microcap uh, industry, which is essentially companies that are worth less than $500 million. Uh, of course, the trends over the last you know, five, six, seven years has been to, uh, to push the IPO as late as possible so that the company is more valuable. Um, but um, uh, there is, uh, those kind of things are, are starting to, to happen. Um, uh, good or bad, we don't know. We'll, we'll see how, how they evolve. But um, uh, Balio here uh, went public uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Europe um, after raising $45 million. Uh, today has a market cap of $122 million. Uh, I think their sales are around you know, the $10 million mark, uh, so that will be a 10x on, on, on their current sales and uh, maybe some other uh, multiple on their, uh, their forecast. Um, but um, uh, this is you know, history being made little by little of a company uh, going to, uh, you know, to the public markets, uh, this time in Europe, 
at a valuation that is you know, uh, sub $100 million, and there is demand for it. Um, this happened uh, actually in the past in uh, the exoskeleton world uh, with several companies going public uh, about uh, three, four, five years ago. Uh, one of those uh, based here called Exobionics, uh, which uh, actually did another interesting thing here. They, they first went uh, public on the uh, OTC market, which is uh, 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 that you, you may know of the, the pink slip market, uh, before uh, graduating essentially to the Nasdaq uh, just a year later um, and raised some money in the, in the process. Uh, um, uh, so that was an uplist. Uh, they have actually competitors here, uh, like Cyberdyne, uh, which went public in Japan, uh, also with uh, very little revenue, and that is valued over a billion dollar. Um, reverse mergers um, uh, are uh, kind of uh, still happening, but also disappearing uh, because uh, this happened uh, over the past year. Um, actually, the uh, regulation uh, uh, under the Jobs Act has been around uh, for quite some time, but it had different chapters. Um, and roughly six to nine months ago, uh, we've had the, the third chapter coming up called uh, Regulation A+, uh, which uh, allows people to raise up to $50 million uh, from non-accredited investors. Uh, so this is uh, quite, quite major. Um, and uh, we've had a, a few hardware companies uh, uh, tipping their toes in that world. Um, including uh, this one uh, called Nightscope, uh, which does uh, autonomous uh, security robots that you probably have, uh, have seen uh, or heard of uh, in the region. Um, and uh, they raised VC uh, b before. Actually, it's not really VC, but um, uh, you know, there was some money before. Uh, and then uh, they went to, uh, uh, to, this, uh, to a platform online uh, to, uh, to raise, um, I think uh, they're planning to raise $10 million or $20 million um, uh, out there. And uh, the mix is uh, accredited and non-accredited investors, uh, which uh, is pretty interesting. The non-accredited investors can uh, invest just $1,000 and be part of the story here. Um, we'll see where it goes, but uh, it went further actually just two weeks ago uh, with this company called Myomo, uh, which is a bit on the old side. It's an, uh, uh, it came from MIT originally. Uh, it's in the uh, uh, health uh, exoskeleton space as well. Um, and uh, in this case, they did the reggae, uh, the same... Uh, uh, thing as, uh, as Nightscope before, uh, but they also do that, uh, did an automatic listing on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so, so we see the, the markets uh, essentially, uh, they're actually not lowering the bar. It's just that you know, once you've raised this much money uh, at this much valuation uh, from the crowd or not from the crowd, you can actually list if you want to. Uh, and that's what um, uh, Myomo is, uh, is going for. Um, Cyberdyne, we talked a little bit uh, about that before. Uh, uh, here, a uh, Japanese company that uh, uh, is fairly, uh, fairly well valued. So, uh, those opportunities are, are fairly new. Uh, we're actually testing our first uh, Regulation A plus uh, 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 campaign with a company called Kindara that was mentioned earlier, uh, doing fertility management. They have uh, a community uh, of over, I think, uh, 5 million people have downloaded the app. Uh, and are, uh, on the app, they've had a uh, uh, 120,000 uh, women uh, becoming pregnant uh, uh, through using the combo of the app and the hardware. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to think that uh, those companies are bringing their community with them uh, onto those platforms and uh, you know, kind of uh, redemocratizing uh, the, uh, uh, the Investment Act, uh, uh, which you know, this one is not Kickstarter. This is getting shares, getting equity in those companies uh, with uh, companies that uh, you know, have large communities uh, on board. Um, it, it sounds, uh, if, you know, if that sounds familiar, it sounds maybe uh, uh, familiar with, with this, actually, that is uh, currently happening with the uh, ICO market um, uh, out there, which um, uh, as, as, you know, can probably qualify as, as pretty crazy, uh, or cray, as, as, as we say here, uh, <laughs> with you know, some companies raising hundreds of millions of dollars through ICOs. Um, but th there is a push for that, right? There is a, there is a demand um, uh, for getting access to uh, early stage good companies uh, and be part of it. 
Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is one aspect of it. This is more for cryptocurrencies. But actually, I'm pretty sure we're going to see uh, a, a hardware startup that, of course, has a community and a software component. Uh, on top of it, you know, raising an ICO pretty soon. Um, and uh, the story will continue to go on. Um, how far it will go, we'll, we'll see. Um, but uh, there is no doubt that everything is accelerating. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the prototype to market is accelerating. Uh, the, uh, the, the product to market to scale is accelerating. Uh, and soon, I think, we'll uh, start to see more companies embrace uh, you know, going public uh, or uh, doing other uh, interesting things uh, in order for them to grow. And um, this is a very exciting time. And you know, so keep in mind that whatever you see here uh, are probably uh, you know, the IPOs of 2021 uh, being born today. And uh, th there, was, there was precedent before. You know, we've had companies like Apple that managed to go public in four years. Uh, they started with zero dollars in revenue, uh, you know, three uh, after one year, uh, seven after year two, then 35 million, then 100 million, and they went public uh, at a $400 million valuation uh, early on. So uh, may the story repeat uh, for all hardware companies uh, 40 years later. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, coming. We're very exciting to, uh, release, excited to release next week uh, the report. Uh, we'll send it to you. Um, and uh, we'll also invite you to uh, our next demo day uh, uh, in September uh, out there. So. Looking forward to, to see you soon. And uh, meanwhile, if you can't wait to see the Hardware Trends 2017, you can go on SlideShare and see the 2016 and 2015 one. Um, so thank you very much again, and looking forward to see you soon.